Every day, Air Canada takes on the impossible, synchronizing the chaos of air travel. When it works, it's a symphony in the sky, an unseen conductor timing the takeoffs and landings of 1,100 daily flights in such a way that 140,000 passengers get to where they want to be, unhindered by delays or lost bags. only it were that easy. The truth is, frustrations are common. So in terms of complexity of getting our passengers safely to where they want to be on time, a lot of things have to go right. There are literally 60 things which need to go right for an aircraft to land on time. Only 30 of those do we actually control as an airline. Bruce Stam leads the artificial intelligence team at Air Canada. Since 2020, they've been working to integrate AI to minimize the potential for mistakes. The goal is to save time. In late October, Bruce's team started using an AI assistant to optimize its scheduling and predict delays. We look at the schedule three to five years in advance. It may not look like much, but it churns through massive amounts of data. Even a 10-minute delay at the beginning of the day can cause a ripple effect. AI and data are going to be part of our DNA, just to do a lot more effective decision making. And next year, they plan on using AI to overhaul the maintenance schedule for their 200 planes. What takes weeks to do will soon be done in 15 minutes. AI is here whether we like it or not. So what we're doing at Air Canada is embracing this, leveraging this to the better of our employees' experience and ultimately our passengers' experience. And it's also fun. <laughs> this may surprise you, but Canada's AI pioneering dates back to the 1970s, when researchers formed the world's first national AI association. And this is a good time to distinguish one AI from another. Let's start with deep learning AI. Found in the software of autonomous cars, facial recognition, and mass surveillance, this is the AI that has the potential to think for itself. And that scares a lot of people. Then there's the field where Canada is considered a leader, machine learning AI, which most people don't realize we already use every day. It curates social media feeds, translates languages, detects fraudulent bank transactions, all driven by human input. In fact, AI is poised to transform everything we do, and Canada is already playing a vital role. For me, the biggest risk is not adopting AI and then realizing its, its maximum potential. In 2017, the federal government invested millions into AI, helping create three world-renowned nonprofit institutes. They guide development in AI research in Montreal, Edmonton, and here in Toronto where Deval Pandya leads AI engineering at the Vector Institute. He's bet personally on Canada's future. I think it's very bright. And uh, if it wasn't bright, I wouldn't move to Canada, I guess. In Ontario alone, he says, there are 20 post-secondary programs with training focused on AI, providing startups with a steady stream of new workers. Last year, we graduated more than 1,000 Vector-recognized master students. and. What is very impressive is 90% of the students, they stay in Canada, in Ontario, after they graduate. Professional services firms like Deloitte help companies find the next big thing. And it doesn't get bigger than AI. Jazz Jodge is a managing partner at Deloitte in Toronto, focusing on AI. He believes AI will be to the 21st century what the steam engine was to the 18th century, electricity to the 19th century, and computers to the 20th century. You know, what really happened in all these major developments? If you look at it, like every major industry changed. Societies changed. Jazz gave us an exclusive look at one of the ways AI will change healthcare. So Mike, let me show you uh, the demo. 
This is your digital teammate calling to follow up with you after your heart failure surgery. Regarding your post-discharge medications, low tensin and... This AI nurse was created in partnership with the Ottawa Hospital to check in with newly discharged patients. It doesn't always look like this. Its skin tone, even the dialect, can be altered to put a patient at ease as a way to ensure post-op instructions are being followed. And if they're not, they will push back. If the hospital's requirements require that, based on a certain response, the patient is being stubborn, yeah. they could be a bit insistent in terms of saying, hey, you know what, you haven't done what you were supposed to, so get on with it. The goal here isn't to replace human nurses, it's to take some tasks off their already full plates while lowering readmission rates. You know, one of the concerns people have, though, is, oh, progress means job losses. Mm -hmm. But it's not as simple as that, right? Yes, this is a hot topic in terms of the anxiety that some people have in terms of the implications when it comes to the workforce, when it comes to AI. The way to think about it is not in a, in a way by which it will replace workers, rather it will reshape the workforce as we move forward. Even as the AI landscape grows, the big picture is already getting smaller. It's tucked away into the arms of these Ray-Ban glasses. Hey Meta, record video. Canadians are now buying products based on a promise. The Ray-Ban camera may work, but the AI hasn't been turned on yet in Canada. The code is still being tested. Are we getting ahead of ourselves? Should we be releasing stuff before we actually are able to fully test it? This is exactly my research area. We shouldn't be. Isabel Peterson is a professor at Ontario Tech University. She's been studying wearable technology for over 20 years. And even she is amazed at how fast AI has become embedded in our daily lives. People went from never experiencing AI themselves to being able to use it on their phones, to use it in their, you know, on their laptops, use it at work, use it at home. And so we've gone through this rapid process in a matter of weeks that in, in some ways other technologies took 100 years. To have an AI assistant in our ear is transformative. And from ear to arm, Hamal Chowdhury wanted to see if AI could be as big a disruptor in the world of glasses as he intends to make it in the world of prosthetics. You have to fight it's it for that great one. Grip. Yeah. <laughs> From Canada, Team Smart Arm. Hamile started Toronto-based Smart Arm after beating out 50,000 other inventors at a competition sponsored by Microsoft. Prosthetic arms he had learned were either cheap but clunky or functional but expensive. So he set out to design something affordable yet remarkable. The world's first bionic arm, where AI uses cameras to dictate movement. Just like the way you know you would look at um, an object like that cup in front of you, for example, and, and grab it, you won't necessarily think about how you'd wrap your fingers around it. We've tried to mimic that human sort of tendency with AI. So it's kind of like hand-eye coordination, just done digitally. So the, the hand will know just to grab. That's right. Which is. Hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around. Right. <laughs> Smart Arm isn't for sale yet. Regulatory approvals are pending. In the meantime, they're testing it on people with a limb difference, including former NFL player Shaquem Griffin. The first time he actually put on Smart Arm and, and interacted with it, we were sitting at a restaurant. He was picking up <laughs> repeatedly and, and like picking up and putting down a, a glass of uh, water, I think it was at the time. And, and you know, he'd take a drink from it and he'd, he'd put it down, he'd pick it up again and like hand it to me. You witness somebody who had never used their left hand before, use their left hand. Yeah, uh, essentially. That'll blow your mind. But as with everything AI related, there are questions. The way that we propose and strategize technologies don't rarely, if ever, turn out. The outcome is always different. That's really interesting because do we really know which way AI is going to turn out? No, <laughs> we don't know. That's scary. Absolutely. There are persistent concerns that AI is moving much faster than the guardrails being built for it. The Artificial Intelligence and Data Act won't come into force before 2025. 
Federal Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, François-Philippe Champagne, says they want to get it done right. There's an acknowledgement. We need to deal with the concerns and the risks so that we can realize the opportunities. And in order to do that, uh, we need framework. We need guardrails so we build trust with people. But trust can be tricky. Until the act becomes law, there is a voluntary code of conduct. The key word there is voluntary. It is incumbent on organizations and businesses themselves to not only wait for things like regulations and these types of directives coming in, but also go down the path of really understanding how can they self-regulate in the interim by educating themselves and learning about how this technology will really make a difference to earn the trust of not only your customers and your constituents outside the organization, but also your workforce inside the organization. But isn't that akin to the inmates running the asylum? There's a danger there. There is a danger there, but at the end of the day, you have to take a multi-pronged approach do not be left behind while everyone else is going to be doing this anyways. This much is true. When it comes to artificial intelligence, Canada's brightest minds are looking to the future. AI is empowering. AI is human autonomy. AI is a transformative technology that is going to make the world a much better place and help us solve some of the most pressing challenges as a society that we face right now. AI just is whatever we make it to be.